doing the uh, YouTube right now. Thank you. Okay, you're all set. Okay, welcome everyone. We'll call the meeting to order at 4.33 p.m. Going to take a quick roll call to make sure that we have quorum. Heather Patchell. Here. Uh, Roxy Finer. Here. Sarah Ethier. Here. Sal Santa Maria. Here. Matt Van Ormer. Here. Frank Treglia. Jennifer Nolan. Frank is coming in now. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. Hi, Frank. Are you there? I see his name, so. And Jen Nolan. Okay. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for, for all. all. Thank you. Just wanted to um, reiterate the purpose of this meeting is to respond to parents' questions and concerns on the Thomason reopening plan, which brings us to item number 3.1 on our agenda. And I will turn it over to Ms. Kloss. Thank you. So we uh, collected from 81 parents <clears throat> a number of questions. Uh, most parents asked more than one in the uh, form. So what I did was I took the questions, I categorized them, put them under themes, and then provided a consolidated response. There were a few questions and comments that were unique that I uh, will be answering at the end uh, since they don't fall under any of those categories. So I'd like to begin. Um, Stacy. I might move quickly through a slide. So I'll, uh, you know, tell me if uh, I'm moving too quickly for you. No problem. Thank you for managing the slides for me. I'm ready to go. Okay. So the first theme that we were looking at uh, under the parent questions, I found that parents wanted to know what are these three models? Um, what do they look like? So you can go to the next one, Stacy, and I'll start off with what Connecticut asked of us. So the State Department of Ed asked that we come up with three models for returning to school in the fall. One that assumed minimal spread of COVID in the area uh, where the schools are located, one that assumed a moderate spread, and one that assumed a high spread. At the time of this request, there was no definition of minimal, moderate, or high, but there were recommendations as to what components should be included in those plans. So for example, high spread assumed that you'd be in distance learning. Moderate spread assumed that there was enough spread where you wouldn't wanna have crowding of students in the building. Um, and then of course, minimal spread, the assumption at the state level was that you would have 100% of your students returning to school all at the same time for uh, a full day of school every day. Right now, the Connecticut status is minimal spread. Um, however, later in the meeting, I intend to talk about what I would like to see for our model, uh, which will be a blending of minimal and moderate. Next slide, please. So our model, uh, if you are in high spread, we would be doing distance learning exclusively and all in-person activities would be canceled. If we had moderate spread and minimal spread, the main difference is 
that under moderate spread, we would have fewer students entering the building at the same time. In other words, we would try to divide the population of students um, right down the middle at 50% so that half of the students would attend on some days and the other half would attend on others, which would allow for greater distancing and allow for um, less crowding on buses. Minimal spread, everybody would be in all the time. And then the main other difference between the two is that sports would be completely prohibited under moderate spread, but under minimal, they might be simply restricted and um, not prohibited. Thank you. So remote instruction is what the state would like to call distance learning. Uh, so I'm using that terminology here, but our distance learning plan last year contained video lessons that were posted on Google Classroom uh, along with assignments and there were no live group sessions. This year, our distance learning will have uh, posted video lessons, but uh, we have put into place the ability for some of our teachers, most of our teachers to attempt to videotape their in-person lessons in a very narrow way, uh, they would only be able to do it from their whiteboard area so that we don't videotape students that are there in person and we protect student privacy. Uh, we do have this here. Our assignments will still be up on Google Classroom. However, because we are going to have the ability to allow parents to opt out of in-person instruction and choose distance learning, then all assignments need to be posted on Google Classroom, regardless of whether we have in-person instruction going on or remote learning going on. And then lastly, we're currently exploring the feasibility of some specialized services being allowed to have live group sessions. Uh, we did not permit this and we're still not permitting it at this moment because we need to be certain that we can protect the privacy of our students. So live group sessions uh, does minimize our ability to protect students' privacy. We're working with uh, the Board of Education's attorney to come up with uh, the proper legal plan so that we can make sure that parents will be confident if they sign on to such uh, a live group session specialized service. Next slide. Uh, so we have the next layer is the moderate spread, which is called uh, the hybrid or blended instruction model. Uh, like I said before, 50% of the students would be here at any given point in time in person. So that would make the class sizes uh, much smaller. We would cohort students with the same teacher as much as possible, not allowing as much as possible for cohorts to mix. And we would be able to far more successfully in this plan uh, separate students uh, at a distance of three to six feet apart, which is the permissible distancing in schools, and all students would have to face in the same direction. So if I can give you a, a, a mental image, uh, picture a classroom from um, you know the 60s, the 50s, um, where everyone sits at a single desk, or if they're sitting at a table, they're sitting far apart from someone else, and everyone is facing the front of the room. Uh, students would not share materials and, of course, bus ridership would be reduced, allowing for greater spreading out on the bus because we would have fewer students. Uh, the minimal spread, which is, like I said, the status that the state says we're at now, would mean that we would bring back 100% of our students in person. There'd be no cohorting. Uh, groups of students would mix throughout the day. Students would be put into three and six feet distancing whenever feasible, uh, but some may be facing in the same direction or different directions. Uh, students would be able to share materials and the ridership on buses would be at full capacity. The next area of parent questions was determining uh, the instructional plan. Uh, you know, what, what phase are we going to choose as a district? So here are the two main factors uh, from the State Department of Education. The factors have to be a combination of indicators of spread in our area, as well as the ability for the district to implement these mitigation strategies like social distancing and uh, spreading students out and minimizing ridership on buses. So with these two factors, uh, we're given some leeway that will allow us to either stick to generally what the state is saying for 
uh, simple spread because we can afford to do whatever simple spread uh, forces us to do. Um, or we could take a hybrid step and say, well, we need that for our mitigation strategies. Uh, an example that I can give you is uh, in the town of Winstead. Uh, the uh, Board of Education purchased an additional building. And from that purchase, they were able to expand the number of classrooms that they could spread the children out over. So they have been proposing a full 100% return to school, but that's because they can reduce class sizes because they've hired additional staff and purchased a new building. Um, in Thomaston, that is not feasible, and that would not be a wise mitigation uh, strategy. Next slide, please. Cohorting was the next uh, main topic. What is cohorting? Why are we cohorting? So I'd like to get into that next. So the purpose of cohorting is to mitigate the risk of spreading COVID. And the definition of it by the state's uh, terms is that we would be grouping uh, classes of students with a teacher um, so that they would function independently as much as possible. In other words, um, if you were in preschool through grade six and you generally stayed in your classroom all day because it's what's considered a self-contained setup, then um, your teacher would be your teacher all day with limited exchange. Or maybe if you have art that day, Instead of you going down the hall to your art classroom, your art teacher might come to you so that you're not cross, um, crossing over with another class in the hallway going to art. Uh, we are able to cohort rather successfully in Thomaston uh, in preschool through grade six. That does change some of the ways that we teach in grades four through six because we were teaching in a more departmentalized style but the flexibility there um, still exists. So we're able to cohort more there, especially with the hybrid and blended um, instruction model. Uh, there are limitations, great limitations to cohorting in grades seven through 12, because we offer our students opportunities to select their classes. Uh, for example, all ninth graders don't take algebra one, so we wouldn't want to uh, change that opportunity to take a higher level uh, math or a remedial level math uh, for those students simply so that we can cohort. This way the students can still continue on with their academic opportunities. Um, so we would not be cohorting to the same extent and it would be grossly limited at the high school. A uh, good number of questions about opting out. What does opting out mean? How often can we opt out? And I tried to summarize that as best as I could uh, in the next few slides. So the State Department of Education said that parent choice for instruction was imperative as part of our reopening of school plan. These are the three options that parents have. They can choose in-person instruction, they can choose distance learning, or they can choose to disenroll their children and go into homeschooling or send them to a private school. Uh, with our plan, disenrollment is not necessary to access online uh, curriculum because we will have simultaneously an in-person uh, curriculum running with a distance learning or remote instruction curriculum. Uh, the concern here I think that I need to highlight for parents is that if a parent chooses distance learning and opts out of in-person instruction for their child and their child is an athlete or their child participates in extracurricular activities, those activities, events, and sports will not be open to them because they are only open to in-person students. The CIAC has uh, given us the ability to make that choice. And if a child is not able to uh, receive an education in person, then we would not want them to be commingling um, on the athletic field. Uh, next slide, please. Opting in and opting out. So in a few days, the parents are going to receive an online Google form link. In that form, it's going to ask the parents to select one of those three options. My child will return to in-person, my child will be doing distance learning, or I would like to disenroll my child. When they make that selection, that is not a selection that is in stone. Now, some districts are, are uh, confining parents to making a decision to opt out 
for a very broad period of time, like an entire academic quarter. And we are not doing that in Thomaston. We are allowing parents to opt back in as they feel comfortable doing so. However, they would need to notify us that they are opting back in. And we would need one week to process the child back into the school system. Now, while we may be able to do it in a shorter period of time, we wanted to give parents a reasonable amount of time to give them the heads up now that we may need a full week to get children back into the classroom in person and uh, transition them and inform teachers and get them uh, ready for in-person learning. If someone, if a parent were to choose in person right now, and then they send their children to school and say, oh, you know what, I think I've changed my mind. They have every right to go back into that form and change their mind, change their status. Understand that we are going to have confirmation from the school. Parents will be contacted when uh, notification is given about opting in or opting out because we wanna be certain that it is the parent that is completing this form and not the child or someone else on behalf of the child. So understand that there are these three steps each time. When you opt out or opt in, parent would need to notify the school. The school would call the parent to confirm and then the, the child would either immediately go into remote instruction or a week later return to in-person instruction. Next slide, please. Uh, cloth face coverings and face shields were the specific questions here, but I also added masks. There was a question about mask breaks. So they are all covered in the next uh, couple of slides. Uh, first off, cloth face coverings, which are sometimes called simply masks, but in the State Department of Education's plan, they emphasize cloth face coverings that completely cover the nose and mouth. These cloth face coverings in the Thomaston plan must be worn by all students and staff. That includes any student who is age two or older and all staff. So if a student is unable or if a parent is concerned that the student may not be able to comply with wearing a mask, they need to reach out to their building administrator um, and let them know their worry. And let's see if we can get some strategies going early on and get us ready to uh, get that child into school in person if that is the parent's intention. There will be emergency disposable masks available to students if they lose their mask or soil their mask, or what I think is going to be the case with some of our younger ones, trading their masks. And we have to now give them a clean mask because they're not supposed to trade because I want that Paw Patrol mask and not the Hello Kitty mask. Uh, so please understand we are ready with emergency disposable masks. However, the district will not be providing a daily mask for every child. Every child would need to arrive either at the bus stop with a mask on or at the front door if they're being dropped off, um, fully masked. Otherwise, they will be asked to get a mask, handed a temporary mask, mask um, or uh, their parents would be contacted because they're maybe refusing to wear the mask that they have. Next slide, please. Face shields were a question uh, one of the parents had. They wanted to know if a face shield was acceptable, if it could be worn um, in school. They are acceptable, uh, but they have to be worn with a cloth face covering according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So the CDC says the cloth face covering is number one, most important and is um, required by our plan uh, and by the state's plan. Uh, face shields are optional and if that puts the parent at ease or the child at ease, they are welcome. However, if they become a distraction and disrupt instruction, they will not be permitted for your child. So as, as much as we need our children to get used to wearing a cloth face covering, we would also need to get our children ready to wear the face shield that uh, brings that extra prote protection that's optional uh, for our, our kiddos. There will be face shields um, available to our staff, so our children will see staff in masks and maybe some staff in face shields as well. Next slide. Mask breaks. So there are three natural uh, mask breaks built into every day. 
with the exception of the first week of school where there is no uh, lunch period uh, in our schedule right now, uh, all the other days of the school year when lunch is served, obviously the children get a mask break because they must eat and remove that mask. Um, and then at recess, if the students are able to spread out enough where social distancing is um, of an acceptable uh, distance, then they will be able to remove their masks. And then of course, any outdoor activity at all that maintains social distancing between people, uh, that would mean you know staff to student, student to student, uh, will be an acceptable way of breaking from wearing that mask. Hand washing, hand sanitizing, and social distancing. There was one question on this, uh, but again, I, I, I wanted to make sure I answered all questions. So I, I put this under a category. So hand washing and hand sanitizing, while they're synonymous uh, to some people, they are uh, a bit different. And uh, I'll go into that in the next slide. So hand washing, in a good number of our classrooms, we do have sinks. So uh, if the classroom does have a sink, uh, hand washing will be the first line of defense for our children and our staff because hand washing is the better option to hand sanitizing if the hand washing is uh, completed correctly. And we will be uh, using our first two weeks of school to teach our students what we mean by correct hand washing. Uh, and then of course, bathrooms, there will be uh, the ability to wash hands. Hand sanitizing. We will have in every classroom, uh, the opportunity uh, through either a sanitizing station or a, a pump of sanitizer, uh, whether you have a sink or not, hand sanitizing will be available. So if you are a parent who prefers hand sanitizing or a child who prefers the sanitizing to the hand washing, we have both options in all classrooms. There may be some sanitizing stations in hallways as well, or in some of the larger public areas. Um, so as those are available, hand sanitizing can occur in those locations. Social distancing. Uh, the main difference with social distancing uh, for us falls between uh, the minimal spread plan and the moderate sp spread plan. So under minimal spread, it assumes that social distancing will be more of a challenge. Um, everyone will still wear a cloth face covering. Uh, however, we'll have all students in place. So the distancing of three to six feet apart will be uh, more difficult to achieve than if we had the hybrid model where uh, we have smaller groups of students, 50% of them at any given point in time. Uh, again, cloth face coverings will uh, need to be worn um, at all times on the bus and in school and whenever social distancing cannot be achieved. There were some absolutely terrific questions about quarantining and temperature taking and uh, what one does uh, within the school and how one notifies parents about uh, either positive COVID tests or suspected uh, COVID cases. So the next few slides will address these topics. Under quarantine, so students and staff must stay home and inform their school if they're sick with COVID related symptoms or if they believe they've come in contact with someone who has COVID. Students and staff must stay home when they're sick, whether they're sick with COVID or just sick because we don't want anyone who's already compromised coming into school and potentially um, exacerbating their condition by uh, potential exposure to other germs or COVID. And then students and staff may be asked to stay home when contact is made with someone who has COVID. So I'd like to explain that a little bit before we go on to the next slide. The Department of Public Health is going to be working hand in hand with, um, with every district. So if there is, uh, for example, a positive COVID case in the town of Thomaston, regardless of the age of the person um, or uh, if they are a staff member or a parent of a student in, in one of our schools, we are going to be notified that there is a, a new case in Thomaston. And then they are going to uh, be beginning contact tracing. If that new case is somehow connected to anyone in Thomaston Public Schools, then we will be notified further of who that person might have come in contact with. And that is when the Department of Public Health will be advising us to contact those people and tell them that they must stay home 
uh, for a duration of time as recommended by the Department of Health. Next slide, please, I believe is on isolation. So isolation is important. In our plan, uh, we had to develop um, a protocol for isolating someone who appears to be symptomatic uh, with COVID-like symptoms. So for a staff member, this would mean, you know, the school nurse would say, you are presenting symptoms that are COVID-like, you need to leave. Uh, that's easy because a staff member can get into their car and go. For a student, they need to wait for their parent. So we have established isolation rooms in each school building so that we don't have the nurse's office be uh, shut down while we are managing a child, um, while we're waiting for a child to be picked up that we've already managed and, and recorded as potential as a potential COVID case. We have a, um, a school health and uh, safety liaison that's been appointed. She's uh, one of our school nurses and she would need to be contacted if one of the school nurses uh, determines that we have a student who needs to be isolated. And then of course we would contact, coordinate and comply with the health department. And while we're doing that for contact tracing purposes and for um, you know, receiving information on how we can get that child to re-enter, uh, we will also be communicating with parents and staff, letting them know um, the distance away from uh, their child that that case would be. In other words, um, you would know if it's in this building or that building, if you have a child that might've come in contact with that child or that staff member, uh, you would get more detail. So that is the type of information that, that we would be putting out and we would communicate that rather quickly. Next slide, we go into further communication. So we would be communicating uh, two ways. If you are the um, parent of the student with symptoms, the school nurse will call you and let you know that that is the case. And then you will be told to come in and pick up your child. And then we will be giving you further direction dependent upon what the Department of Public Health tells us. And then of course, if you're not the parent of the child with symptoms, you will get a school messenger message. And I need to point out at this moment, while this wasn't a question um, asked of anybody, I wanna point this out to parents who are listening. If you have ever opted out of a dimension of school messenger messages, like you said no emails, or uh, you've gotten a new phone and you've never uh, added yourself back uh, for a text message from school messenger, uh, now is not the time to block yourself from communication. We will try very hard not to abuse um, the system and over communicate. But I think at this point in time, parents would appreciate receiving timely and frequent communications uh, about COVID. So if you are a parent who knows for sure or doesn't know for sure if you have everything in line for the different types of school messenger messages, uh, I first ask you to, to check uh, your, your PowerSchool account. And then if you can't figure out uh, if you have all of the boxes checked, then I ask that you go on to our website and seek uh, information there as to how to work with our IT staff to get you to that point where you can be put back into the school messenger communication loop. Now, when will we be communicating with you? Of course, again, the parent of the student with the symptoms is gonna get a call ASAP, but the parents of all the other students will get contact immediately after the parent with the sick child gets contact. Um, and then this would also go if we had a staff member. We would uh, immediately after we've processed the staff member uh, through the protocol, we would be contacting parents and letting them know that a staff member is presenting symptoms. Temperature taking and, and COVID testing. So we will not be taking temperatures uh, of students upon arrival, students as they enter the bus, uh, staff members, et cetera. We will also not be demanding COVID testing prior to the start of school. However, the Department of Public Health, uh, our local uh, Torrington um, Area Health District may require it depending upon uh, conditions that have been brought to their attention. But at this point in time, there is no obligation on a daily basis for the district to be taking a temperature um, or for the district to demand COVID testing of any of the staff or students. Uh, there uh, most likely will be a checklist though. Uh, thank you, Stacey. There most likely will be a checklist of sorts or some way of checking in to uh, give us a heads up about the conditions uh, that your child might be experiencing. 
but right now it will not be as formal as uh, one of our staff members taking a tent. Thank you, Stacy. So Mrs. Anneke, our uh, absolutely wonderful uh, school nurse at Center School and our district nurse coordinator is serving as our district-wide COVID-19 liaison. Uh, so she is going to be uh, the person who oversees uh, information uh, insofar as receiving and disseminating, processing it, translating it for us, making it useful to those who are not in the medical field. And uh, therefore, if, if you're a parent and you're concerned or you're, you're questioning any of the protocols that we have related to uh, isolation or um, quarantining, um, I encourage you to email Mrs. Anneke. Uh, the State Department of Ed is developing this position and uh, she's now gonna begin to work with the Department of Public Health on a more regular basis now that the state knows what they'd like to do with these liaisons and I'm very, very happy to have someone with her years of experience and her um, very sharp decision-making skills. I mean, they're absolutely on point. So I'm, I'm glad to have her and we should all be very pleased and trust whatever she tells us to do. Next slide. Cleaning and disinfecting. There was one question about cleaning and disinfecting, which is exciting to me because that uh, could be interpreted as parents are confident that we will be taking care of that. Uh, just the same again it's one question and i wanted to make sure i answered it so on the next slide i will go into our cleaning and disinfecting protocols so back at the beginning of uh when covid started to reveal itself and data was being taken there were some uh, bits of information as to how one should manage cleaning and disinfecting and this is the right now disinfecting protocol uh, based on what's been learned over the last six months uh, to eight months. So any frequently touched surfaces or objects are going to be routinely cleaned, sanitized, or disinfected. So that could mean throughout the day, students are going to see a member of our custodial staff uh, coming uh, through their classroom area, uh, ch checking door handles. Uh, it could also be that um, any bathroom surface uh, will be addressed um, with greater frequency than what we addressed it in the past. Children's books and paper materials. Uh, in the beginning, there was some question about this, but right now the data shows that they don't need additional cleaning and disinfection. So that should be some good news to uh, parents. That'll be one um, less thing we need to concentrate on and one less worry for you. Um, to limit what needs to be disinfected and cleaned, uh, we are going to maximize um, every opportunity uh, as feasible to have individualized bins for, for sensory materials or for materials that would have typically been shared, um, bins or packets. So for example, if in the past uh, you uh, participated in art class and the art teacher would stack the watercolor trays of paint um, in the corner of the room and you would go and just take an arbitrary uh, watercolor tray, um, in this world, you would have a tray assigned to you if that was feasible, or uh, you would be sharing a tray with someone, but there would be a disinfection um, of that tray occurring prior to the next person using it. So that's why it says whenever feasible, uh, we may have to choose the disinfecting versus the purchasing of um, materials for every single child. Next slide. Oh, breakfast, lunch, and recess. Yes, there were a few questions about this. So uh, on the next slide, you see breakfast and lunch. So when we have minimal spread, all children are in the building, um, everyone's in person, all the meals are served in the cafeteria as, as normal. Uh, if we have moderate spread, the difference would be we'd have fewer children because we're in the hybrid model. So everything's the same as minimal spread, except we by default have 50% fewer children in that ballpark. And of course, if we have high COVID spread, the school buildings will be closed and we would establish um, a location to uh, provide emergency meals. Recess. Each school building um, addresses certain um, activities a little differently and even uh, some grade levels for that matter. So recess is one of those activities. So in order to provide you with uh, accurate information the uh, administrators are devising, uh, for lack of a better term here, a COVID handbook. 
that will acclimate parents and students and staff for that matter on the changes to what we know as the typical recess behaviors or recess um, encounters or activities. And you'll see uh, several times during uh, my Q&A session here that uh, this will come up over and over again when we need to get to specific information for parents uh, we are going to be putting it into a handbook, and we're hopeful that that handbook will come out the week of the uh, 24th. Uh, bathroom and hallway access, uh, including passing between classes. This falls in that same category of recess. So you'll see on the next slide that I'm pointing to the handbook again. Um, uh, so in this case, the use of a bathroom in the elementary school could look very different than the use of the bathrooms at the high school. So instead of coming up with a uh, generic district plan, each building will have a plan that meets the needs and is age appropriate um, for those students and that will be put into this handbook. Specialized courses. Yes, there were some questions about physical education, about music. So I uh, answered them uh, on the next slide. One of the great things about Thomaston is our size. And uh, because we are small and we have um, a, a, a veteran and expert staff, uh, we have a level of expertise where we're able to um, apply that expertise to our specialized areas and come up with a course uh, protocol, uh, protocols for those specialized areas. So um, over the summer, our instructional and non-instructional staff have been developing uh, protocols to augment our uh, broad-based plan. So our uh, reopening plan that was sent to the state was a broad stroke plan to respond to the state's requirements. These specialized protocols respond to our community's um, understanding of what we can and can't do um, and what uh, we're, we're uh, willing to uh, permit while still implementing those mitigating strategies. These protocols, while they're not done just yet, uh, we had a little bit of a delay because of uh, Stormy Saeus um, with the power out outages and such, but uh, once they are completed, they will be shared with the Board of Education, the parents, and all staff uh, for that matter, so that everyone will know exactly what's happening in a physical education classroom or what's happening in the library or how we manage um, a science lab. So this is this is a terrific dimension that I have to say uh, right now is quite unique uh, to our plan and I'm quite proud of the staff for uh, participating in this uh, protocol writing this summer. Busing and parent drop off. Parent drop off was the bigger question but uh, busing was asked. So on the next slide we'll start with busing. Of course, if we're in high COVID spread, there's no transportation because there's no in-person instruction. The main difference between a moderate spread or a minimal spread is the number of students on the bus. So if we're in the orange uh, plan, we would have 50% of the students coming to school every day. So we would be able to have seating restrictions. Uh, if we were in the yellow uh, plan, then of course our buses would be at the typical capacity levels and that would uh, disallow us to have seating restrictions. One of the uh, things that I need to emphasize again is cloth face coverings must be worn uh, the minute you get on the bus and uh, worn the entire time. To be sure that our students are uh, remaining safe while on the bus when they might sneak a mask break and we won't be able to see them, um, we are going to have every window open uh, that can open on our school buses, uh, regardless of the temperature um, until we are past the point where uh, we can really claim containment um, as opposed to any spread. So my advice to parents are, you know, pack that little jacket, even though they don't wanna wear it, but they may appreciate it when they get on that bus and sit for half an hour with every window open um, when we have one of those chilly mornings in mid-September. But that is how we are going to deal with uh, busing. We are not hiring monitors for the bus and we are not expecting our bus drivers to look backwards while being on that bus. Uh, we are uh, of the belief that 
a, a monitor can't get up in the middle of a bus ride anyway. The seats are too high for us to see most of the uh, students in the age group that we service. So the monitor would have to, at every bus stop, get up, walk through uh, all of the seating areas, uh, which would cross contaminate the bus um, and would simply agitate and aggravate or be duped because the child's gonna quickly learn the, the, the routine and pop that mask back on. So we would much rather trust that our children are going to be safe. And then as a backup, have all of the windows open so that we have maximum uh, circulation of fresh air on the bus. Next slide, please. Pick up and drop off. So again, this is one of those things where you'll get information in the handbook because those of you, um, those parents out there who um, have gone through a couple of our uh, different schools by now, if you have, let's say, uh, you know, a fifth grader, you would have seen what pick up and drop off looks like at Black Rock and it does look a little different at center school. Um, and further, even different at the high school. So instead of, again, coming up with a generic plan for pick up and drop off, those plans are going to be articulated in this uh, COVID handbook uh, by school. Uh, special education and Section 504 services. Uh, this is going to relate to in-person versus distance learning instruction. Uh, so on the next slide, you will see uh, that I point to those differences. So special education um, services will be provided in accordance with the instruction option that's in place. So as a parent, if you are choosing in-person instruction, then your child will receive in-person special education services. If you choose remote learning for your child, then they will receive their services remotely. And of course, if you disenroll your child, uh, you, you don't receive those services in that way. Uh, the Connecticut State Department of Education, at the time that I uh, prepared this slide to uh, send over to uh, Stacy to have for tonight's meeting, um, actually a half an hour ago when I got the email, uh, the state said that they were going to be sending us guidance. That initial guidance has just been uh, released. So any other guidance that comes out, uh, whether it's released publicly or not, we will share with parents and make certain that, that we apply it to our special education and 504 services. Schedules, yes, there were many questions about schedules um, and I tried to uh, touch on each of those. So one of the questions was, you know, why, why are we starting off with such a, a shortened school day? What's the purpose in this gradual length, lengthening of the day? Well, the, the purpose of it is to gradually extend practice time um, so that staff and students are able to get used to mask wearing, get used to uh, the new protocols for using a bathroom. Um, in week one, we'll do a grab and go lunch so that the children can keep their masks on the entire time that they're there uh, at school and not have to worry about taking them off and figuring out what to do with them. And then of course week two, we add an hour to the day and go to a more normal early dismissal schedule. And that's when the children will be able to go into the cafeteria and have lunch, remove their mask, and begin to practice how to manage their mask when they have to take it off. So the purpose of gradually lengthening the day is both human-centered and student-centered, but it really originated from being student-centered, but I do have to say it's going to benefit everyone, including the adults. Start and end times. These uh, start and end times will be published on our website. Uh, basically, if you look at the week of September 1st through 4th and compare it to the week of September 8th through the 11th, you will see that our typical early dismissal day um, has been cut by an hour uh, the first week. So we have what we're calling a COVID early dismissal that first week. One of the major differences in that um, first week and the second week for that matter is that typically when we have an early dismissal, our half-day preschool has an afternoon session that's canceled. However, it's important that they get the same opportunities to practice, to practice with their mask, to practice with protocols, to practice um, this new way of sharing, which really isn't sharing at all. Um, so how is it that they're going to practice interacting? So the, for the first week of school, our half-day preschool will spend an hour um, in class, um, each time they arrive in person and our uh, 
full day pre preschool through 12th grade will be with us a little bit more than three hours. And then that'll grow in the second week uh, to an hour and a half for the half day preschoolers and then um, to about four hours, um, which is our typical early dismissal time. And that's when we'll be serving hot and cold lunch. And then beginning September 14th, we'll have a regular dismissal um, unless we have some other kind of dismissal plan, we will go into a full day of school. The IAC athletics, uh, sports, there were a few questions about sports. So on July 30th, the CIAC approved a, uh, a fall sports plan and they deemed it at that, at that point, they deemed it as a starting point for conversation. And they claimed that they were going to be having a meeting this week uh, to come to a final decision which might alter that plan. Uh, I received about 15 minutes before this meeting, I received a message from the CIAC indicating uh, that they are uh, keeping the July 30th plan as written and they're moving forward with fall sports. So any of the parents of our student athletes out there, uh, please know that fall sports as of this moment are moving forward um, under the, the guidelines of the July 30th fall sports plan. And I'm sure you'll get more information from our athletic directors about that in the very near future. Uh, but remember, if you choose distance learning for your child and they are eligible uh, to, to be a member of one of our athletic teams, they will not be permitted to join our athletic team um, in practice or in competition because they are not attending school in person. Child care, this, this, is, um, this is a very troubling thing for me to, to uh, have to respond to um, as a parent myself. So on the next slide, I provided some information about child care in the area. Um, our biggest dilemma with childcare um, at, the, at the basic level is that uh, childcare centers have had some rules put upon them, which have minimized uh, some of their uh, flexibility to accept children um, in larger groups or um, allowing, they, it doesn't necessarily allow for uh, children that might come in only after school to commingle with students that have been in that uh, childcare center all day. So with that in mind, we know that that's a, a new layer of complication. Further, um, as you'll hear later in the meeting, I'm um, proposing the hybrid plan and that would put upon parents the need for childcare if they don't already have it. So uh, the Plymouth Family Resource Center, uh, I put the contact information there. They service many areas, including Thomaston. What they'll do is they will make referrals to parents of um, known childcare uh, facilities. And what I thought uh, would be great information to have is all the other towns that they service because if any of the parents work in these towns, uh, they may also be able to tap into uh, some childcare in those towns on their way to and from work. The other option is to call 211 or to go to 211 online and uh, see their list of area child care centers that are accepting children at this time. Um, but yes, I, I understand that child care is a dilemma for a good number of parents, uh, but I, I need you to understand that what I'm proposing later does not ignore that. What it's doing is it's uh, providing for the health and well-being of the children that are entrusted to me and to my staff. So um, we had to go with safety and, and health first, and then childcare uh, will do all that we can to help you with resources. So if you're really in a dilemma with childcare, uh, you know, contact your school, contact my office, and we'll see uh, what we can do to help you out if 211 uh, isn't helping you or if the Plymouth Family Resource Center uh, doesn't have anyone to refer you to. We'll work with you. Next slide. Oh, we have the unique uh, questions, which uh, I, I formed more into uh, simple responses, but there were some unique questions that did not fit under any of these categories. So the next few slides address those. Uh, one was a, a very interesting question from a, a parent who said, you know, if, if my child lives with someone who has a, a high risk condition um, and, and my child is exposed to COVID at school, uh, what do I do? You know, how, how can I, how can I uh, 
guarantee that my child won't be. Well, I can't make that guarantee. Um, if a child lives with someone who is a high risk person and uh, exposure to COVID is uh, a concern, then the parents have to make that decision um, based on what's best for their family. What I can do at my end and what our staff can do here um, in the schools is to maximize you know, health and safety um, protocols so that we can minimize the spread of COVID. But I would be uh, bold faced lying to you if I told you that COVID would not enter our buildings um, just by its prevalence alone, it's, um, it's almost expected. Uh, the other was the, the uh, this per particular family asked, um, is the district gonna pay for my child to go somewhere else if we don't want them to um, go into your school? Uh, no, that is not exactly the answer someone would wanna hear, but no, we, we are not obligated to uh, provide funding for an alternative um, instructional model. That's why the State Department of Education insisted that we produce a model that would run uh, simultaneously with in-person. So we have our remote instruction and our in-person instruction as to uh, very strong options for our students. So if, if you're a parent who's concerned about returning, you would have for no charge at all, uh, the remote instruction option here in Thomaston. I think there might be one more slide under unique questions. Oh, there's a couple more. Um, a parent asked, you know, I'm having difficulty, you know, making this decision about if I should send my child in person. If we go hybrid, uh, how will I know if the class size meets my needs? In other words, if a parent's looking for a particular minimizing of students that are cohorting with their child, um, how will they find out? So my recommendation is they should contact the school principal. One of the things that you're uh, going to find out later when I uh, propose the plan is principals are going to be doing a lot of work uh, determining how we would split up our students for the hybrid model. And they would be the ones who would have the most current information. So absolutely, if you need to know class size before making that decision, uh, definitely send an email out to your school principal. Uh, this I thought was uh, very interesting and I'm glad it was posed. The next item says, the Board of Education uh, meets virtually, yet they're planning in-person instruction. And uh, the point that was made was, you know, isn't that hypocritical? And uh, it does uh, appear to be hypocritical. It is uh, definitely hypocritical if you don't know the backstory. So here it is. The State Department of Education and the governor are demanding in-person instruction. They are not allowing us to do distance learning um, in toto uh, without extreme extenuating circumstances such as an outbreak. And that outbreak would have to be measured by what determines that red zone. So we really are being uh, pushed as districts across the state to prepare for in-person instruction. Um, and meeting virtually is uh, what we plan to do until school opens. So yeah, that was excellent. It does seem hypocritical, but understand uh, we are trying to balance on that tightrope right now between what's best for our students, staff and community and um, how to meet that demand from the governor and the state. Oh yes, and, and this was a, a very good question. So um, I want you to understand the answer. So a parent asked, will the teachers that are the in-person teachers uh, be the same people that provide the remote instruction. And I'll say to you right now, yes. However, this may change because we are also in flux right now. We're gathering information from our staff because as, as parents have the, uh, the choice to opt in or opt out, some of our staff don't have a choice because they might have a comorbidity issue, a medical issue um, that is going to prohibit them from being able to come back uh, to in-person instruction, or they may have some other qualifying issue like childcare because their children are in a district that has a, a schedule that doesn't match our schedule here in Thompson. So the answer is yes for now, and that the likelihood of it changing is very high because any teacher who's unable to perform in-person um, responsibilities will be assigned to remote responsibilities and therefore you could have 
a different teacher for online instruction than you would for in-person instruction. That concludes uh, the responses to the uh, questions from our um, 81 parents who participated in uh, that survey over the weekend. Thank you, Francine. Um, I'd just like to make a few notes before we continue. Um, Jennifer Nolan is present and I would like to check uh, Jennifer and Frank's audio in case they have questions throughout the rest of the meeting. Jennifer, can you speak? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. And Frank, are you able to? Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can with a little feedback. Thank you. Yep. Um, Frank, I think you have two uh, accounts open. If you could mute one of them, that should eliminate the uh, reverberation. And if there are any board members that um, would like to speak and or if they make um, any motions, if you could just state your name so it's um, we can have it recorded for the minutes. Thank you. Hey, Beth, if, it's Sarah. I have a, yes. qu a couple of questions. Could I just okay. emphasize that we do have some of our student reps that have joined us, Beth. So if they would like to speak, I wanna make certain that, that they have the same um, opportunity as our um, adult board members. Certainly, certainly. Thank you, Francine. Yeah. Okay, okay. go ahead, um, Sarah. Okay, so Francine, I know the younger kids get snack. How would that be working with um, us going back to school? Yeah, that was one of the questions that came up. I held uh, two faculty meetings today, uh, excuse me, uh, Monday and today, district-wide, and snack came up, uh, drinking water came up, and so we're going to work on what that's going to look like, because we are trying very hard not to remove masks in the classroom, uh, because then why not wear, why not just not wear a mask? So we're trying to have designated areas for removing masks. So whether that means we would find a space outside of the classroom to have a snack, um, or if we would go outdoors if it's possible, we're working on that right now. So uh, we wanna make sure that parents understand we don't have an answer to that just yet, but uh, we'll try to either get that into the handbook or get that into a separate communication. Okay, with that same um, token with a snack, with the mask break. So the only mask break that the kids would be getting now would be lunch and recess, right? No other time? Or if the, if the teacher chooses to do some instructing outdoors. And that, that has to be coordinated because what we don't want to do is have 300 children outdoors uh, that will uh, eliminate the opportunity for them to remove their masks. So that's something else that we talked about in our staff meetings this week, which is coordinating that use of outdoor space so that we can um, eliminate the mask uh, for as long as we need to. Okay, and going with that same thing again, what about PE? Will they be allowed to take their masks off during PE? I know a lot of districts are allowing kids to not have masks during PE. Yes, so if PE is held indoors, the answer is they shall have PE with their mask on. And I know that sounds uh, really strict, but it has to be strict because our PE air circulates through the rest of the building as well as our classroom air. Um, so we're trying very hard to um, give the opportunity for students to use PE to go outside, but if outdoors is not available because it's raining, then they would be wearing a mask and, um, and adjusting what they'd be doing in class. And that, that was in uh, the plan and it's going to be addressed in the PE sub plan, that specialized plan. Right, yeah, I know a lot of parents had a problem with kids running in masks indoors. I mean, I, I do too, That's, that just doesn't seem good. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would assume that there would be an alteration of, of what's being offered if masks have to be worn. And again, this is the right now, Sarah. So as we get more and more guidance, we are going to take full advantage of that guidance. So if the guidance allows us to make a change, we will. Right now, this is the strictest point we can be. We would have been stricter three weeks ago. We would have been stricter six weeks ago. Um, we are at a point where we're less strict now than we were back then. So as things move along um, and, and people have more data from summer school, summer camp, then we'll be able to say uh, what flexibilities we can put in place for mask wearing indoors. Okay. Um, and what are the consequences for students not wearing a mask? 
Okay, so let's let's look at it a little less on consequences and we'll start with let's assume that the child is not used to wearing a mask. So it's it's our um, plan to assist the child with strategies on keeping that mask on. And then if the child is still unable to wear the mask, uh, we're going to go a little more formal and uh, make sure that they understand that if they don't apply the strategies that we've worked out for them, that there could be discipline. So that would become you know, consequence one. And then we would do progressive discipline as we do with all of our uh, students. We don't go from zero to 60. However, there is a dress code policy that the board voted on in July that states that all students age two and older shall wear a mask while in school or in our vehicles. So the child could ultimately, if they were being obstinate, uh, could ultimately be disciplined based on their violation of that policy. And we're hoping that by doing this gradual return to school, that will minimize the, the consequences because we won't have as many incidents of children not wearing a mask. Okay. Um, what if there's a financial hardship for parents with masks? Are we gonna, you know, I know you said that you would have the emergency. What about parents that can't provide a mask? So help me understand what that would mean, Sarah, because um, masks are not that costly. However, if a parent is really suffering a hardship, uh, they can contact the agency that's helping them with that hardship, like in town, or they can contact us and we can see what we can do for them. But right now I, I find uh, purchasing of a mask, um, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to categorize as a hardship, especially when it's the difference between um, your child's health and safety. Um, or not. So again, though, to be reasonable, we have town assistance for someone who's suffering such a, a terrible hardship, and we also have school assistance. So that parent should really reach out to whoever they, they utilize in the town or one of us and say, look, I just, I can't, I can't put out that money for a mask, or my child is chronically losing a mask and I'm not buying another one. We need to figure out a way to help that parent get a mask so that that child can come to school every day. And we'll work with them, but parents need to reach out to us. Don't wait for that first day of school when the child doesn't show up with a mask and hope that every day we're gonna say, okay, here's an emergency mask. Tell us what you need and let's, let's get the child used to something that's more um, realistic than something that appears punitive. So I think wearing the emergency mask isn't as cool as wearing a Paw Patrol mask when you're you know, in first grade. And I would want to make sure that, that we get that child a mask that would be something they'd want to wear. Because one of the pediatricians said in my meeting um, Tuesday with the Department of Public Health, they were asked, what's the best mask for a child to wear? And he gave an absolutely wonderful response. It was a mask that they will keep on. So I want to make sure that that child whose parent cannot afford a mask, we get a mask for that they will keep on. Yeah, they, no, I, I they've got to yeah, tell I us, Sarah. They've got to let us know. So any parent out there that's listening, got to let us know, and we will do what we can to get you a mask, um, and to also work with you so that we can keep you from needing masks. Because maybe they need masks for other people other than the child that's coming to school. Right. Yeah. No, that's. I was just asking. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and what about bathrooms? I know last time when we were on our meeting, you had said that there might be closures at times. I'm just thinking of the elementary age students that, you know, have an emergency. Would they be able to go to like the nurse's office? Well, again, that's going to come out in that COVID handbook. So each of the buildings is going to deal with bathroom use in their own way. It's going to be age appropriate. It's going to be um, what can be managed for cleaning. It's going to be what can be accessed quickly. Um, so that is how it's going to be set up. So for me to give you a comment on, on what they can or can't do, um, I would say it's, it's premature for that. So let's wait for that handbook to come out and then you'll know what the bathroom protocol is going to be for the building that your child is in. Okay. Francine, it's Beth. Do you have an idea of when that handbook is uh, going to be ready? We're, we're hoping for the 24th of August. Thank you. I also have another question. Um, it's kind of lumped into one regarding the no lockers. Yes. Um, 
Are they going to minimize the school supplies? Are their assignments going to be on Google Classroom? What is the requirement or the plan going to be for their backpacks um, and sports equipment for the athletes? Where are they going to store that? Yeah, so again, that would come into that handbook because each of the buildings has, you know, we know that we have lockers at center school and we also have lockers at the high school. Uh, and then we have the athletic areas um, at the high school or how they manage their equipment. That's going to be left up to what's in that handbook. We're going to let the buildings decide what is best because they know what's going to work. What we wanted to do by closing lockers was to reduce touch points. And then that would also reduce the need to concentrate on disinfecting those lockers. So a solution will be um, provided and it'll be in that handbook. Um, and also understand when I say the 24th, I'm looking at that as we need to get it ready so that we can share it with our staff. And if we need to make any tweaks to it, we can have that week to work on it. But I'm um, relying on my admin, so I don't wanna make a promise that they can't keep. So I'm gonna be very careful with that. Uh, but I know that the pace that they're working at. So I think the 24th is a fair date, but if it's the 25th, I don't want any parent to be upset. Thank you. And I'm, I'm sure this will be in the handbook too, but as far as um, the high school drop-off, will the yeah. students uh, be able to arrive prior to 725 like they have in the past? Okay, so again, that would be something that would be noted in the handbook as to whether they would have access. We're still intending to serve breakfast, and typically at the high school, the kids that, that arrive early, you know, go right to it. Um, but again, I don't know what it is that uh, is being planned because again, we need to take what we normally do and overlap it with those mitigating strategies so that we can minimize uh, what's being spread um, across the, the, the buildings or, or uh, between classrooms. So you'll get that kind of information in that handbook. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Francine, I have a couple of questions. This is Jennifer. Hi, Beth, Jennifer. You, I'm sorry, Beth, were you done? I'm all set, Jen, thanks. Okay. So my question is regarding the symptoms. So, so many of our childhood illnesses look similar and so many of the things that the kids experience when they get back to school are very similar to the symptoms of COVID-19. Yes. So when the kids are isolated, does that mean each time somebody has sore throat, runny nose, cough, that is kind of maybe wasn't at home, showing up at school, they go to the nurse, they get isolated, that a announcement would be sent to parents, would there be, would you wait for, what would you wait for in order to notify all the parents, just because these symptoms are rampant in the fall? Yeah, so right now, again, I use that, that term, right? Right now, the Department of Public Health is, uh, giving us a list of what symptoms to look for and how to report them to the Department of Public Health. So for example, if we have a child who is allergic to ragweed and it's a high ragweed week, that poor chickadee could come in with a runny nose every day before COVID mm -hmm. um, and, and appear to be feverish because their eyes are irritated. Um, what the Department of Public Health is telling us is these are the symptoms you need to look for. If those symptoms present, you need to be able to make a judgment as to whether or not this child is experiencing COVID or not. Well, let's be honest, we can't make that judgment. Our nurses don't have that ability. You would have to be tested for COVID. So if a child is someone who has allergies or some type of a, of a chronic condition that occurs every fall, uh, the likelihood of them being um, put into isolation and having the house called uh, for a potential COVID condition is very high. And that is something that right now, no one has a solution for. The Department of Public Health is having us err on the side of caution because we are not able to, with our medical um, instrumentation, with our medical resources in the schools, we are not able to discern whether this is COVID or not. So that is why we need to work closely with the Department of Public Health because we would want to make sure that they understand, oh, well, this is a child that generally has this problem every year at this time, what would you like me to do? And then the Department of Public Health may have a series of other questions to ask. So the answer uh, to, to your multi-part question is, yes, the child would be isolated assuming COVID, whether or not it is COVID based on symptoms uh, and based on um, advice from the Department of Public Health. And then the child may even be asked to self-quarantine until one can prove or disprove that they are COVID symptoms. Um, the parents, 
of that child would be given that information and then the parents that are in that school building or across the district will be given information that a child was sent home with COVID-like symptoms. Um, so it is going to be a bit messy um, at the beginning of the year. And that's another reason why I would much rather have 50% of our students come in at any one given time at the beginning than have all 100% of them there because that could also help us in isolating whether that is, you know, Johnny sneezing because we had an outdoor class most of the morning because I wanted them to have a mask break. Mm -hmm. You know, because that really could be the result. We could be doing a great thing by giving a mask break, but then we're outside with the ragweed. Right. So that's understood. And it's going to require a lot of patience and understanding from parents, a lot. And that's why we're very happy to have so many days at the beginning of the year for professional development with our staff, because we can talk about why would you, when would you send a child to the nurse? Okay, so kind of a follow-up to that. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, I meant to start by saying thank you. That was a ton of questions and information to compile in a really short time. And you did a really good job. So I wanted to start by saying thank you to that. And I forgot to. Thank you. Um, and I know there's so many moving pieces that it's hard to keep up. But with that, if the child is sent home and asked to quarantine, um, can are those children going to be allowed to shift to distance learning quickly? Because where does the attendance policy fit in with this? Um, okay, that's that's two questions there. So okay. yes, yes, they can immediately go right into distance learning. That's the easiest part. So if a child were to be uh, suspended from school, if a child were to be self quarantined or forced to quarantine by the school, or if a child were to be opted out uh -huh. by the parent they all have immediate access to that distance learning. Okay. It's, it's only when they would come back that they would have to transition. So if you're okay. opting out, we need a week's notice. If you're being quarantined, you gotta finish the, the quarantine period. Okay. The other part is about attendance. One of the things that um, my colleagues and I have been complaining to the state about is that you're allowing the students to opt out, but you're still gonna take attendance on the students that are in person. So what is to say that a child who's in person isn't gonna to decide to opt out tomorrow because he's out sick with something that isn't COVID but is afraid to come in because he doesn't want people to think he has COVID. Um, and then he just chooses to opt out so he doesn't get mar marked absent. So right now the state is uh, really dizzied by this question. I don't think they even contemplated it when they thought of the opting out option. Um, so right now, we have to take attendance for every child. But the way that we would take attendance for an opt-out child or a child who's quarantined online um, would be through engagement, as opposed to in person, you have to show up. So what we've asked for is if we can have some kind of a marrying of the two that will allow for the equity that the state keeps touting in their plan, but is not appearing to understand nor apply to attendance. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm all set. I think that was all I had. Awesome, thank you. Francine, I, it's Sarah. I thought of another one. Um, are we gonna be using the green cleaners or are we gonna be able to use like the heavy disinfectants? Yeah, we've been able to use non-green cleaners for quite some time now. Um, we have had some loosening of that and it's, it's been wonderful because we can get a, a whole lot more done and um, feel more confident about it. So yes, we are not using green, green cleaners. Uh, one of the things that we are striving to do is uh, use cleaners on surfaces that children touch that are food grade safe as opposed to something that is highly toxic. And if we have to use something that's highly toxic, then we're going to use it at a time of day or a day of the week where we know that um, when the children return, the effects uh, won't, won't, won't linger because they won't have access to any kind of um, live chemical. So yes, we're going for food safe so that the chemical still disinfects, but it won't uh, cause harm to the child and we are not going green. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, the other thing I had was about lunch. I know you were talking a lot about cohorting. So is lunch gonna be cohorted as well? Yeah, so depending on uh, how each school works it, uh, 
if we had to keep if we had to keep the cohorts pure that would mean for example we'll use center school because they have the fewest number of grades right so they have nine homerooms that would mean nine lunch waves which would mean they'd start eating lunch sometime around eight <laughs> and the last lunch wave would finish around two um, that's not practical so that's why the term maximizing cohorts is being used. So we would maximize cohorts as much as possible, keeping the kids cohorted in their classrooms as much as possible, but allow for them to be in the lunch area, not commingling because they're all facing the same direction and they're sitting by section, um, but be able to have, you know, not have a need for like, if BlackRock would have been, I think 14 lunch waves. Um, this way we can have smaller lunch waves. We may have a few more lunch waves than normal, but we would have um, the ability to know who eats lunch together so that we can cohort in the classroom and then cohort by lunch. Okay, so eating in the classroom then is not an option. No, it is not. We're unable to manage the cleaning. Uh, we would not be able to disinfect if everyone is eating in their classroom. And then it also goes against our uh, plan to keep the classroom, um, hold it sacrosanct for mask wearing. So, so that it's not a confusing concept and most especially for our little ones. So the classroom is where you wear your mask and get your work done and the cafeteria is where you eat and maybe sometimes outside. The last thing that I have to say is about the daycare. That's what really worries me about our working families. Um, I know that two and one is probably gonna, you know, refer to play and learn and the other newly opened daycare in town. I think it's heavenly. Um, and I know that the FRC in Plymouth, I don't think runs during the summer. So that it, it just really worries me. And that that's why I really hope that if we could make do with, you know, if parents can work together and get, you know, childcare that we can make sure that those kids go on the same day. Yeah, so Sarah, you might have some relief um, knowing when I present the plan that I'd like to, to take, you'll know the tact at how we're gonna be grouping the children and what we're hoping to achieve. Because what I wanna be able to do is after we um, have a semblance of grouping in the hybrid plan, I wanna be able to hear what the parents are planning because maybe my neighbor is gonna watch my kids. Um, I would want my neighbor's kids going to school the same day as mine. Uh, to to make sure that that um, that or that organization of time can work, uh, so that's one of the tiers of what we're going to be open to. We may not be able to match everybody's need, but we're at least open to hearing what they're trying to do. Again, there could be someone who says to us, "Gee, my typical day off every week is a Monday and a Tuesday. Could you not put my children on Thursday and Friday?" That's a very reasonable request. Um, on the surface, but we need to make sure it works for, for their children and that we can make the cohorts work and keep them stable. So um, one of the things that we're going to try and do is work with parents. So I think that's going to be um, the plus and the minus of it is our flexibility will make the cohorting um, stability um, not necessarily finalized until very close to the first day of school. And we wanna be able to provide that flexibility, but if we cut that off early, um, we could end up with some parents that um, are in a quagmire and, and we need to help them. So understand that for us to provide that flexibility could mean that we're still moving students around on the rosters to get everyone in place and to maintain that 50% or close to it um, population each day. But see, that's another positive of being small, Sarah. You know, that's another positive is that we can, we can hear from a parent, you know, gee, my, my neighbor lives on such and such street. You know, I, I wanna get my child there in the afternoon because they're doing childcare for me. You know, we, we have that ability to hear those, those requests and make an attempt to satisfy them. I can't say that we can satisfy them all, but we will do our darndest to make things happen for parents. Yeah, that's my biggest concern because I know we have a lot of teachers that live in this town and I know that they're going to be expected to report to school. So, you know, meeting their needs, I think is really important. 
well, they should come and work for us because uh, we're working very hard to make sure we meet our teachers' needs too. Um, so <laughs> they, they should be working for us because I think that Thomaston is, is providing our staff with as much flexibility as we can. And if, they're, if the town that they're working for isn't, I wish they would give me a call and I will call my colleague who runs their town and let them know how wonderful Thomaston is and how they should mimic us. Because if you have a staff member who's feeling stressed out or can't get the job done, um, it's absolutely worthless to them, to, to their families and to the kids. So it would be my pleasure to call any one of my colleagues in the surrounding towns and let them know that they should give some flexibility to those uh, parents of ours who teach for them. Of course, I'm assuming that my word holds, um, you know, fear or <laughs> imposes on anyone, but again, it would be my pleasure to, to help in any way. Does anyone else have any other questions for Francine at this time before we move on to the next item on the agenda? Okay, we will move on to item number four on the agenda, which is the reopening of the schools. Um, item 4.1 is, is the um, updated version of the Connecticut's uh, plan. And item 4.2 is Thompson Public Schools reopening plan. And I believe Ms. Koss will speak to that as well. Yes, most of uh, the information that I have here is um, information that you saw either through the answers uh, to tonight's questions or uh, during my uh, presentation to the board about the reopening plan. But uh, what I've done tonight is I've created a, um, a modified version of uh, the model that we would have called moderate spread taking uh, the parts of minimal spread and incorporating them into the moderate spread model uh, because we are in a, a position where the COVID data designates us, you know, deems us as minimal spread, uh, but we as a town cannot uh, perform all of those mitigating strategies or maximize those mitigating strategies if we have 100% of the children come back. Um, that's my recommendation. So tonight I'm going to ask the board after making my proposal to take action on my proposal. And the action would be to uh, go back under the yellow model, to go back under the orange model, to go back under the red model, or to go back under the model that I'm proposing, which is this modified version of, of the two initial models. So um, my modification uh, would be that all schools would be open, uh, In-person activities would be uh, prohibited after school, but sports would be um, restricted or prohibitive if the CIAC says it's prohibited, but, um, or if we have COVID spread. But uh, in the moderate spread model, there would be no sports. So I'm taking the best part of the minimal spread model allowing for sports, and I'm applying it to the moderate spread model, which would minimize the number of students that would come in on any given day of the week. Uh, next slide, please, Stacey. So the hybrid blended instruction model, the moderate spread model um, has about 50% of the students in person at any one point in time. So that would shrink our class sizes, which would allow for us to maximize our, our social distancing opportunities. It would cohort students together with the same teacher as often as feasible. I said in an earlier slide um, that that would be much more simple at the pre-K six level and uh, very limited at the 712 level. Uh, students would be seated in their classrooms and in the cafeteria facing the same direction. So they would be in rows, they would be so many feet apart, and uh, that would maximize the social distancing, um, even with masks on, they would still have to wear masks. Uh, students would not share materials. If they had to share materials, it would not be a simultaneous sharing of materials. So I'll go back to my watercolor tray example. So we would either buy watercolor trays for every child that, that is going to use watercolors this year, or 
the teacher would designate those watercolor trays to these particular children right now, and then disinfect those watercolor trays for a group of children tomorrow or the next day or next week. And then by default of having only 50% of the children in at any one given point in time, our bus ridership would be reduced and that would allow us to um, have some restricted seating so that children would be distanced on the bus. Next slide. Uh, the factors I, I brought up earlier in making a determination as to what plan uh, the district should go with, one is community spread and the other is our ability to um, implement those mitigation strategies. Uh, I am heavy on the ability to mitigate, to perform those mitigating strategies and doing it with 100% of the children back right now, uh, that's just, it's not, it's not wise because we cannot provide students, if we have 22 in a typical second grade class, um, 18 to 22, let's just bring it down to 18. Um, I can fit about seven children, maybe eight, in most of the classrooms. So even with 50%, I've got nine. So let's say that we have uh, you know, one or two percent opt out. So that's still gonna bring me to about seven every 50% day. Otherwise we'd be at somewhere around 16 um, if we were in full force. So I am asking for a hybrid model that's modified because we are going to have a great deal of difficulty otherwise uh, performing these critical uh, mitigation strategies um, with the yellow model. The social distancing would be three to six feet apart. We would still be wearing our cloth face coverings except when we're eating, or if we can be outdoors, um, six feet apart and managing social distancing. And it would be a hybrid model where students would come in two days a week as a group, 50% or so of the population would come in on Monday and Tuesday, 50% of the population or so would come in on Thursday and Friday. Wednesday would be used um, exclusively for distance learning. And on the days that children don't come into school, they would have distance learning assignments and lessons. Breakfast and lunch would still be available. All schools would be open. The 50% population would still have access to breakfast and lunch and all meals would be eaten in the cafeteria. Busing, we would use the moderate spread plan. So that would allow for the seating restrictions. We would still have cloth face coverings. We would load and unload the bus with um, some strict rules of filling from the rear to the front. Uh, but we are not going to have bus monitors there to reprimand a child. We are going to simply open the windows and allow for maximum air circulation um, because we know that the seats, the children can hide behind very easily and a monitor cannot go up and down the aisle when the bus is moving. So how are we going to determine the 50% group um, for Monday and Tuesday versus Thursday and Friday. Sarah, I had started to uh, talk about this. I, I think that was one of your questions. It might've been Jen's. So we're starting first with siblings and families. And I'm very deliberately saying siblings and families because we have siblings, um, but then we might have stepchildren because we're in a blended family. And further, we may not have official stepchildren because we're a blended family, but uh, we're not blended through marriage. So we have children that live in the same household but have no legal relation, but we all know they live at you know, 123 Main Street. So we would want to make certain that all of the children that live in the same household are grouped first. Then the administrators would look at those groups and start balancing the number of students so that we can have about 50% coming on Monday and Tuesday and about 50% coming on Thursday and Friday. And then the last step would be for us to look at staff conflicts and parent conflicts and try to address them as much as feasible so that we can keep number one and number two intact. So I'll go back to my example. If a parent says, I always have Monday and Tuesday off, my goodness, we need to schedule their children on Thursday and Friday so that Monday and Tuesday, the parent does not need to seek childcare. Next slide, please. So because I am uh, very concerned about making a decision tonight, having the board take action without giving a, a, a finite period of time, 
I have uh, selected a time frame so that parents can anticipate how long this hybrid uh, plan would last. So I am asking the board to approve this plan for September 1st through October 9th. September 1st is our first day of school. October 9th is the Friday before Columbus Day weekend. Uh, that will allow us to gather some good data about how we are managing ourselves with 50% of the population, how we're managing ourselves with distance uh, instruction, remote instruction, and it'll help us make a really good decision going forward from October 9th. So when would that decision be made? So the board, I would be asking the board in September to review the data that we've collected about COVID cases, potential COVID cases, conditions of, of childcare, uh, number of students that have opted out, number of students that have disenrolled, um, how many people have changed their minds from one to another over that period of time. Um, and I would want the board to have a deadline of the 28th of September uh, by which to review this data and take further action to decide to either continue in the hybrid plan, go to full distance learning, or go to full 100% uh, of the population, which is uh, the yellow plan. And December 20th is a, is a good date because it would allow us to gather um, a good uh, 20 days or so of information before we get to that date. So that's several weeks of really good um, information about what in-person instruction is looking like and if we can expand it or if we need to contract it. But this is assuming both the duration and the review of that plan is assuming that if, if COVID spread conditions worsen, we may not have an option because the Department of Public Health is going to shut us down or impose greater restriction on our hybrid plan. So Thank you, I'm Francine. Asking, yep, so I'm asking the yep. board tonight to accept the plan um, as I've modified it and to accept the duration of the plan as well as uh, the date by which we need to review the plan so that parents can anticipate news about the next so many weeks of school. Um, most area districts are doing a hybrid plan. They're either in process of getting approval from their boards or they are um, already uh, announcing it. Uh, Wolcott is one of those. Um, I know that most of the, uh, the districts in this area are choosing to do the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday option uh, because the if, if higher COVID spread occurs, we can use Wednesdays for uh, higher uh, disinfection and deeper cleaning, whereas right now we don't need to do that because of minimal spread. Okay. Before we make a motion, Francine, I just want to um, thank you and the administrators and the teachers and all the staff, um, those members of the reopening committee for working so hard on this through the summer and getting this plan into place. Um, we appreciate all your hard work, so thank you. Thank you, and, and I, I thank them as well because without them and their expertise, uh, we would definitely not have a plan of this capacity. I think it's a, a, a wonderful plan. It's not perfect for everyone, but it's definitely one that keeps in mind health and safety. Thank you. Um, do we have a motion from the board and then we can have discussion on the motion? This is Roxy Feiner. I'll make a motion to approve the modified hybrid blended instruction plan that would run from September 1st through October 9th, 2020, with a review date of September 28th, 2020. Jennifer, I'll second. Is there any discussion on the motion? It's, it's Beth, uh, Sarah, it's uh, Beth, it's Sarah. Um, I have yeah. a question uh, to Francine. So when we did the parent survey, was the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday option the most that parents wanted? Uh, there, there was an even spread, but for the most part, um, I think that my statement about why we were using Wednesday might've led them to that, uh, but it was a, a pretty even spread with the exception of um, if we had Fridays off, there didn't seem to be much interest in the Friday. So I had put out to parents 
um, the question and I advise them that based on holidays and based on um, cleaning protocols that the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday uh, was the best option. However, I did ask them to vote on it. And uh, it was, like I said, um, a leading question. Forgive me, please. But I wanted to give them the information as to why I was leaning toward it. This is Jennifer, I have a question. Um, Francine, is this plan in line with the kids that do out of town busing with how will their transportation will work out of town the, the two days, the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday? So if they don't have school, we, you know, obviously we won't, we won't run their buses, but if they do have school and we don't, we will treat it like we typically do. So if we have like a PD day and, and Waterbury doesn't, we still run our buses to Waterbury. The only time that we don't run buses when they have school is when um, there's a, a weather issue and we've shut down buses because of weather. Now, if they have a COVID issue in their area, you know, if it's a Waterbury thing or a Bristol thing or, you know, Cater Tech kind of thing, uh, we may choose not to provide transportation because we don't want to transport someone with COVID spread, but we haven't gotten to that point yet with transportation because we're being told by our local Department of Public Health that they would be quarantining those people anyway. So we may not have to stop transportation if there is a COVID condition because the one with COVID would not be on the bus anymore. So the short answer is they'll still have transportation. Is there any other discussion or questions for Francine? Hi, just um, Matt Van Ormer. Um, I, I guess my hang up with the uh, hybrid plan, looking at multiple other school systems, because my wife teaches out in Wilkett, and um, I have multiple brother-in-laws that teach in other school districts. I just, um, I guess my fear with the plan is it's, going to seem similar to preventing the kids from getting in any type of routine, um, which I thought was the big struggle with distance learning when we went to that at the end of the last year. Um, and just going to school two days and then distance learning for three days and then the weekend and then trying to do it all over again. And with uh, families that don't have parents home or have their kids watch being watched by somebody else during the day, I think last time when we did the distance learning, learning plan, most of the state was shut down. So a lot of families had a parent that was kind of forced to stay home mm -hmm. um, to do distance learning with their kids. And now that everything is at least three quarters of the way open up again, that's not going to be the situation for a lot of families. Mm -hmm. So we'll make the three distance learning days even harder than they were last time. And I don't see them as overly successful last time we did them. Um, although I, I think the effort everybody put in was amazing. Um, and I think we did the best that we could with the situation that we kind of got thrown into. Um, but as a successful learning process for the children, I don't see it overall as a very successful distance learning accomplishment. I understand. The, the plan is for, um, it's, it's the, uh, what do you, what do you, how do you say it? It's like the, um, the best of, of all of the bad options, right? So what are these options? If we go back full force, then we compromise health and, and safety for our children and our staff. If we go back 50%, then we uh, compromise uh, what would be childcare concerns or uh, routine of being in class. We need to get the kids back in school. And, and the only way we can do that right now um, safe, the safest way, I won't say the only way, the safest way that Thomaston can do it um, is to bring them back in in a smaller number uh, for so many weeks and get them used to coming back to school, get them used to the routine and then build them up because it's a new routine. It, it's, not a, it's not even a, ma a matter of amnesia from the old routine because we've been away so long. It's going to be so foreign from the original routine, we need to get them up and running. And do it this way, we get the best of both worlds in the sense that we get the health and safety, but we also get the gradual bringing them back 
and, and giving them the opportunity to connect with their teacher. Because one of the things, Matt, that was very difficult for us with distance learning was making that, that teacher-student connection. Um, a lot of my, my teachers are very concerned and they wanna make sure they have that teacher-student connection. And including some teachers who might not be able to physically come back, they're desperate to come back because they want that teacher-student connection. So having the two days a week allows for that teacher-student connection, which will be an improvement because when they go online on the days that they're not in school and then they show up again for in-person instruction, the level of accountability now has changed exponentially because now they have to face their teacher and they didn't get their work done as opposed to when we were all ghosts sitting in our houses and um, you know, uh, uh, having the ability to pretty much get away with not participating if we didn't want to or sitting silently when we were supposed to be. Now they have to participate in a different way. And that's exciting because if God forbid, we end up with uh, a distance learning um, scenario again, uh, we would have mastered that relationship and we would be able to also make some of those improvements that I talked about in that slide, which compared 1920 to 2021. I'm really hoping to get more live time uh, for the staff and the students as well so that we can improve that connection. Do we have a um, just even an estimation about how many parents were looking to opt out and go strictly to distance learning? In the original survey, the question was, would you um, opt out if it was um, hybrid? Would you opt out if it was a full day? We don't know for sure what their plans are until we ask them outright. And we won't know that until the beginning of, of uh, this weekend when we put out that actual link and say, start telling us what you're, what you're thinking about. Now, the parents who've reached out to me have reached out for different reasons. They've said either, gee, I'm, I'm betwixt and between. I don't know what's best uh, for my child. And then there are other parents who are saying, no way, not until there's a vaccine am I going to show up with my child. So. Some people are definitively, um, you know, they know what they want and others are still on the fence. And tonight was really the key, I thought, to have parents tune in and hear what our model will be because then they can make a real educated decision as opposed to, you know, that, that one parent question that I thought was a great one. You know, what are the class sizes gonna be under hybrid? Cause that might be the reason why I keep my child out of school or put them in school. They need to have real information so they can make um, that critical decision. So uh, anything that was gathered in that initial survey was more of a, a hypothetical. And what we're going to get this weekend and in weeks to come, is going to be the, the definitive response. And we will be responding to that as quickly as possible. And we're doing the same with staff right now too, Matt. Um, we had uh, an initial uh, list of staff that was uh, significantly smaller than we thought it would be saying that they weren't going to come back. And as I suspected, um, part of human nature is when it comes upon you, when, when that moment has to happen, when you have to make a decision, um, you may change your mind and, and you may not want to come in and, and you have fear. So we need to give our parents a plan. So whatever the board votes on tonight is going to be what will help them make that decision. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. This is Roxy. Um, I'd just like to say that while I sympathize with parents and the issue with childcare, our responsibility as a board is to educate, challenge, and inspire the students. And given the current conditions, we need to do this in a safe and responsible manner. And if this is the plan that's going to educate, challenge, and inspire our students safely, then this is the plan the board needs to adopt. Thank you, Roxy. I will say that the Department of Public Health, including our local executive director of the Torrington Area Health Group, meets with us on a regular basis. So the big Department of Health meets with us every Tuesday as, as a group of superintendents um, and medical staff. And then we also have these additional meetings with our local Torrington area um, health district executive director. And we put them to task this past week and said, um, if you were running schools, then we know you don't understand what we do in a school like you understand what you would do in a medical environment. Would you choose 100% uh, 
back or would you choose a hybrid that would reduce the number of students? And across the board, the answer was reduce the number of students. Of course, they're not dictating what kind of hybrid, you know, what that model looks like, if it's a half day, split day, that kind of thing, but it's reduced the number of students. These are the people that are doing the contact tracing in the state. These are the people that are gathering the data and sharing the data and, and giving that terrible news um, to the people that need to be quarantined or to the people that have taken tests, letting them know that they're positive. So these are the people who are telling us hybrid is better. And the State Department of Education, excuse me, the State Board of Education met today and about 20 minutes before our meeting, um, the resolutions were shared with me and they are allowing for a hybrid model, which they were not allowing for before, um, in, in so far as allowing it if we can't mitigate um, contagion and if it's, uh, for in the best interest of the child. If we're making a good faith effort, they will permit us to choose a hybrid when the COVID spread level doesn't match hybrid. So that's the case right now. The COVID spread level is yellow, but the hybrid is an orange level, which would mean we'd be somewhere above 10%. And right now, you know, uh, the governor says we're, we're under one, but, um, you know, that's with some secondary uh, information as well as primary information. If we look at just primary, we're at about two and a half percent. So I'm telling you that I'm going on expert advice to be able to protect our students and staff. And I can't guarantee that COVID won't enter our doors. I can't. That's a lie. But I can make certain that we take steps necessary to minimize it minimize the opportunity for it to get in and spread. Is there any other discussion? Um, just remember you might be on mute if you have any questions or comments. This is Heather. I just had a quick question. What does a Wednesday look like for a teacher? Are they in school cleaning? Are they in school doing a live lesson or are they home? How, how is that looking for them? So it would look different depending on what the um, COVID spread level is. If the COVID spread level is higher, then no one would be allowed in the building on a Wednesday and they would have to do all their work remotely because that would be the day we'd be doing deep cleaning. While we're still in the yellow phase, the building would have uh, some access flexibility. The teachers would be working. The teachers would be expected to perform remote responsibilities on Wednesday. Um, how that will work and, and what that will look like. It could mimic what we were doing on Fridays last year, but it, it's most likely going to be um, more flexible than that and more expanded. Uh, but right now, uh, Wednesdays would be work days for teachers and they would be days where they would be able to interact with each other and or their students. Okay, um, I, I'm with Matt in the fact that um, a little more needs to come on the distance learning side. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was unsuccessful by any means, but I, I feel like the, uh, the teacher interaction needs to, to be a little better. So hopefully we could, we could work with that with the teachers. Okay. I, I made a note of it. What I'll do is, uh, when we, uh, when I meet with our curriculum director and, and we review the distance learning plan in preparation for the kickoff of the year, um, we'll look at what, ways we can improve. And like I said in my other slide there, comparing 19, 2019 to, to now, uh, we are looking at ways of improving engagement through either live sessions, more live sessions, or minimally um, live sessions for specialized services so that we can uh, reach those children in ways that we weren't able to necessarily reach them before. Francie, and this is Sarah. I was just wondering if we could explore the option of doing stuff on Zoom too. I know that other districts have, and it's been pretty successful. Um, that would be maybe something that they could do on Wednesdays. Yeah, so Zoom behaves like Google Meet and Google Meet is free and Zoom is about $90 per user. So we're not using Zoom because that is not where we wanna put our funds right now, but we will be using Google Meet. So when we were using Google Meet last year, uh, we were using it by appointment, um, 
Google Meet is upgrading their product and we're still waiting for the specs on that, but we're hoping that they'll have some of the great components of Zoom added to it. Uh, but Google Meet is available to all of our staff. We had uh, paraprofessionals working with children through Google Meet last year. We had staff members working with children through Google Meet. So it's a matter of expanding that because I think that the majority of the students didn't have the same experiences as some of our special education students did with Google Meet. Right, yeah, I'm just thinking that if the kids could all get together and see each other, that would be a positive thing for them, you know, to interact with peers as well. Even if it is Google Meet and not Zoom, I was just throwing that out there as an example. Yep. Any other discussion or comments, questions on the motion? Frank and Sal, I just wanna make sure your audio is okay. Uh, it's a sell. Yeah, my audio is my audio is okay. Um, and just my opinion is, uh, I I know that there's concerns about you know last year and stuff like this here, but I agree. You've got to get the students together a little bit, and we just don't have the space to do it five days a week. So, I'm I'm hoping this hybrid plan actually works. Uh, and that's my two cents. Thank you, Sal. Okay, we will um, vote by consent for this motion. So I will only ask for those opposed or abstain from voting. At this time, is there any members opposed to the motion? Uh, Matt Van Armour, opposed. Sarah Ethier, opposed. Any other members opposed to the motion? Are there any members abstaining? Any members abstaining? Motion carries. Uh, we'll move to item number five on the agenda, which is the quotes for the bathroom, touch, touch equipment. Um, and we need to, sorry, Francine, I don't have on the agenda the, um, the policy. Oh, uh, sorry. I believe there's a, the waiver that we need to vote on um, or the policy that we need to vote on for the waiver. The policy um, is 3320. Purchasing proceeds. So what we're looking for is to um, waive the bidding process to um, get the equipment into place before the start of the school year. Do we have a motion? This is Jennifer, I make a motion to waive the bidding process so the equipment can be purchased before the school year. There a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Any discussion on the motion? Again, we will uh, vote by consent. Are there any members opposed to the motion? Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Um, Let's see, the next item on the agenda, I believe is the adjournment. We don't need to vote on those, um, those quotes, correct, Francine? No, ma'am, just on the waiver process. Thank you. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? I make the motion to adjourn. I'm going to second. Any discussion? Any opposed? 
the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all uh, members and Francine for your time tonight. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good night.